Dr. Turner, could you give us some background on how you came to the health and wellness field? Sure. Well, it dates back to a childhood interest. You know, as I think is the case for a lot of people who are passionate about what they do and find excellence in their field, it kind of dates back to something that captivates your attention when you're a child or engages your imagination, right? It really drives you to explore and develop yourself in a certain way. And for me, a lot of it dates back to a certain health class that I took in high school. So it was just your regular sophomore year high school health class, okay? But prior to this, I was an athletic kid, but I also had some bad habits, okay? I had a, I, I like to eat cereal late at night, for example. Every night, you know, 8 or 8.30, I'm going out in the fridge, grabbing my milk, going in the cupboard, looking around. I was uh, really a big fan of Honey Nut Cheerios, in fact, and so even to this day, it's kind of a temptation, you know, late at night, and uh, don't tell anyone that, but... <laughs> Um, so I would, I would have some late night snacks, you know, eating candy bars, having chocolate milk at recess, things like that. And I was always kind of a chubby kid, so I wore husky sized clothing. And I remember I had a birthday party one year and I was kind of embarrassed. We, we lived in California near the beach and this was supposed to be a beach party. We were going to go boogie boarding. And I remember I had to take my shirt off in front of the other boys. This was a little bit, you know, discomforting. And then everyone else was running around in their wetsuits and I was having trouble getting in my wetsuit, right? So I'm pulling on this thing, I'm like shoving. It felt like trying to put some spanks on or something like this, you know? I was like trying to get all my little chub inside this wetsuit and I finally pulled this thing up and it was like so tight I could barely move, you know, I could barely breathe. And I'm just wallowing around like this fat little sausage, just kind of embarrassed and everyone else is having fun. I'm like, this is terrible and this is my birthday, you know? <laughs> What's wrong here? So, so that was me before my health class. And as I got into the class, you know, I was pretty engaged, right? Because I'm learning how the heart works and how your brain works and your eyes, you know, your nervous system and your lungs, your muscles and all this. And so I started running, I started lifting weights and moreover, they had a nutrition component to it. And I remember one day they had us write down everything we ate. Okay, so, you know, all the labels on the ingredients. Um, grams of sugar, grams of fat, that kind of thing. And so I'm looking at my chocolate milk, I'm like, oh geez, man, this joker has, you know, 12 grams of sugar in it, you know? Oh, the Snickers bar I had, this got 10 grams of saturated fat, that's no good for me. You know, so that really opened my eyes to some things and I, I made some radical changes um, and set me on a path of just inspiration of how healthy could I be, you know, and what would it look and feel like to, to, to take better care of myself. All right, tell us a little bit about your education and training now after this experience. Sure, well from there I went on to Stanford University and I majored in human biology, had a great experience. Um, many of my classmates actually were high level athletes. The year before I started um, was the 1992 Barcelona Olympics and actually Stanford University I think if they had been their own country would have placed like sixth or seventh in the total medal count at that Summer Olympics. So I had classes with people that I was watching on TV the year before winning swimming meets, track and field and stuff like that. It was pretty cool. So I had a great experience. I also got to meet Tiger Woods. So before he turned pro he was at Stanford for a year or two and um, he was already kind of a big phenom. And so <laughs> one day I'm at the driving range. The one day in my entire career that I was at the driving range because I'm not a golfer. I'm standing there you know hitting. Everybody turns on and looks at me. They're staring at me. Nobody else is doing a thing. They're all turning and staring right at me. I'm thinking, well, I'm, I'm not that good, but I'm not that bad either. You know, what's going on? And so I turn around and Tiger Woods is standing right behind me on the players area, you know? And so I say I met Tiger Woods. I never actually talked to him, okay? But I just kind of stood and stared at him next to him. So I was, you know, <laughs> a stalker, I guess. But that was, that was kind of cool. So, so Stanford was fun. I learned a lot and I got motivated um, by some highly achieving people and got encouraged by some great professors to go on. So from there, actually took some time off before medical school. And I was a school teacher for a couple of years. Um, I worked as a property manager. I did some odd jobs up in Lake Tahoe. So I drove a bread truck. I sold lift tickets at a ski resort. You know, just kind of a lot of different things, which was great because it gave me an understanding of working class, you know, people. What's it like to just kind of go out and have an hourly job with no benefits? You know, I remember one day I was um, delivering bread in my bread truck. It was icy, it was in the winter, living in Lake Tahoe. I'm 4.30 in the morning, I'm carrying bread out to my bread truck. I slip and fall on the concrete in the parking lot. Okay, I crack my elbow, my bread trays go flying. I'm sitting there nursing my elbow and I'm going, oh my gosh, I hope nothing's broken, right? And I'm just thinking, I don't have any health insurance, you know? If I go to the doctor, it's probably gonna cost me like 75, 100 bucks. Plus, I don't get paid for that day of work. So I'm also losing that day's wages, you know? So I'm kind of getting myself back in the van, I'm nursing my elbow, driving one-handed around that day, just praying that my arm's not broken or something like that, you know? And it slowly kind of kind of came together over the next few days, thankfully, but that was a great experience. You know, I got in touch with what 
different people are, are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the teaching was fantastic too because I really enjoy explaining concepts to patients and I try to take that with me. You know, I'd see a big element of my job is actually informing that patient what's going on in your body. You know, you have to live with your body every day the rest of your life, right? I want you to be highly informed. I want you to be highly understanding what's going on as understanding of your situation as I am so that you can be as motivated as I am to feel better and take care of yourself. The final part was um, I got to go to Harvard Medical School, which was fantastic. I met diverse, talented, you know, inspiring people from all over the world, actually. And uh, I remember there, <clears throat> at one point I got to meet Dr. Ben Carson, who's now the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and a documentary movie was made about his life. He wrote a book, he's a famous neurosurgeon. So um, that was pretty inspiring for me too. I got to actually talk to him, sat down on the couch, shook his hand, you know, and he asked a few polite questions about my life, and that was just pretty cool for me. <laughs> and then finally, I ended up at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and that was a phenomenal experience. You know, it's considered one of the best healthcare institutions in the world, frankly, and for good reason. And it just felt neat to be a part of something like that. I remember they have a dress code. You have to wear a suit every day, um, full full shirt, full tie, full jacket. You know, as you're walking around the hospital. I didn't own that stuff, but you know, pretty soon I jumped right in there. I had my outfits. And you know, there's a certain sense of pride. And if you ever go to the Mayo Clinic, if you walk around, it doesn't feel like a clinic. It feels like a five-star hotel. Okay, there's marble everywhere, huge chandeliers, beautiful pieces of art. They have these Dale Chaluli blown glass chandeliers that are probably 30 feet wide, you know? And so you just feel like you're part of something professional um, and excellent and outstanding, and you want to sort of uphold that tradition. And so I always carry that with me, even since then, that sense of professionalism and uh, excellence. All right, give us a little bit more detail about how you decided on physical and rehab as your specialty. Physical medicine and rehabilitation? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, I love it because it's a non-surgical field and it has to do with rehabilitating people from their injuries, you know? So my concept is I will do everything possible with you, exercises, vitamins, supplements, injections if need be, um, to help rehabilitate you and avoid surgery. And most musculoskeletal problems don't need surgery. So therefore, I can help most people. And you know, it dates back a lot to some of my childhood interests in athletics and sports and having my own injuries and trying to rehabilitate myself from many of them along the way. How long have you been practicing and where? Well, I moved from Mayo Clinic to Richland in uh, 2009, so I've been here slightly over 10 years. And I've been at Cadillac the whole time uh, until recently, which is exciting. So I branched out and started my own practice here in the last couple months. So do you have any other specialty areas other than just the rehab medicine? Well, yeah, I would say I have three areas of expertise or specialization. Um, so one would be sports medicine and non-surgical orthopedic care. Um, a lot about, you know, what I mentioned before, aches and pains, helping rehabilitate people. Some people are injured athletes, some people are just getting a little older, having some arthritis, or maybe pregnant, having back pain that didn't totally get better after the delivery, something like that. Um, another area of emphasis for me is fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. Interestingly enough, being here in the community for over 10 years, um, I started to see patients who would also have these symptoms and no one was really taking good care of them. You know, typically the primary care would know that they had a problem, know that it was kind of complicated, not quite know what to do with these patients. A lot of times they would go see rheumatology and they'd be told, you don't have lupus, you don't have rheumatoid arthritis, but we do know you have something, it's probably fibromyalgia. And then they're just sort of dangling. The rheumatologist didn't necessarily want to treat them. Um, either. So there was a space and they really weren't being taken care of well at all. Moreover, I had some family members who have suffered pretty severely from fibromyalgia, from chronic fatigue, so I was personally motivated as well. So that's a big emphasis um, that I've developed over the years and something I quite enjoy. Um, the turnaround and the quality of life that we get can be tremendous and is very gratifying. I think the last part uh, that I'm quite interested in is men's health. And this is basically the concept of taking this guy who's getting a little older, right, and his primary care doctor saying, you know what, your blood pressure's getting high, your blood sugar's a little high, you're a little bit overweight, you know, and he's telling the doctor, yeah, my sleep is not great, you know, I'm kind of fatigued, I'm a little frustrated with life, maybe I'm a little depressed, and kind of giving him a men's health makeover, right? Like, how do we get this guy feeling like he did 10 years ago, you know, right? Get him back feeling good about himself, you know, get him back energized mentally, physically, back in the gym, or whatever his particular goals are. So men's health has been an important part of what I do as well. Okay, I think that kind of goes to my next question, but what makes you different from other practitioners? 
A great question. Um, I would say a few things. So I would say number one is my passion for what I do. I care about my job. Um, I actually don't really view it as a job. I view it more in terms of a destiny or a calling or utilizing God's gifts that he gave me. Um, I like to say if I won the lottery, for example, I would still show up tomorrow and be a doctor and do what I'm doing. Okay, because it's so intrinsically satisfying and fits right in with my interests to such a degree. So I'm passionate, I care about what I do. Um, and because of that, I'm always searching for the best possible way to bring care to my patients. Um, along with that, I would say I'm tenacious. Um, <laughs> meaning I don't give up, I don't know how to quit, I don't quit, you know, so I'll have patients and, you know, they may have seen many other doctors, a bunch of treatments didn't work out, people are frustrated, I'm like, hey, let, let's do everything we can, you know, and I don't quit, I'll go research some things after hours, come back to that patient and really try to bring, you know, something new to the table. Um, something else I think about me is I listen well, I, I try to at least, I'm told that I have, <laughs> so uh, I kind of feel like if you listen to the patient long enough, they'll tell you what's wrong with them, uh, that's sort of an adage, if you will, but it's, it's very true. They're trying to tell you what's wrong. They don't quite have the same words that you have to understand it, but if you listen to them long enough, they will tell you what's wrong with them, and you can, the diagnosis will become apparent, as well as the treatment options that are best for that patient, right? Because no two situations are the same, right? Although this situation right here is a rotator cuff shoulder problem, right? This is different if it's a 21-year-old mom with three young kids at home, okay, or a 50-year-old power lifter, or an 85-year-old woman in a nursing home with a walker, right? And so the treatment options for each of those three people are going to be quite different. And so you have to listen to the context of the patient. You know, what are their fears? What are their concerns? What's their history? Um, how much tolerance do they have for taking risks, for trying something new? How much patience do they have for getting better, right? How frustrated are they are with the medical system, you know? How desiring are they to get off medications? How absolute are they to want to avoid surgery? Or maybe they're overzealous for surgery, you know? So you have to take all these factors into account to really give the best option for the patient. Um, and I think a, a final aspect I've been told, um, and I know that this is quite important for me too, is a spiritual aspect of things. So when I talk to patients, I'm not just thinking of it as a body, a machine, we gotta fix this machine, right? I'm thinking of it as a human being, right? Mind, body, and spirit. And so there's a spiritual emphasis to what I try to do of encouraging them, um, showing them God's love, and trying to bring that healing focus through to what we're doing together. Okay, now we've heard a lot about your work life. so. What are some things that you do outside of work for fun? Oh, sure. Um, I would say um, I exercise. I find that fun. You know, when I go to the gym, I tell my patients, it needs to feel like recess, okay? It's like a dull recess. That's the concept, right? When you're a kid, nobody says, okay, it's recess. Everybody, make sure you go out and run. You know, have fun. Like, make sure you get active. It's like, no, bell rings. We're out there running around having fun, right? That's the same concept. When I go to the gym, I don't necessarily have an agenda. I'm not working myself too hard. I'm, I'm trying to have fun and you know do it in a sustainable way. So that's a big outlet for me. Um, I like to read, I like to journal, um, I like to eat. You know, I like to eat, absolutely. So a special food, I'll plan out my foods. You know, I'm gonna go here for lunch and have this dish, or I'm gonna go over here and have this dessert later on this week. So that kind of brings a lot of pleasure to my life. Um, and I like documentary movies quite a lot too, or biographies. So I just, it's kind of like truth is stranger than fiction, you know, and, and better told a lot of times too. Okay, so that brings us to my next question. What's your mm -hmm. favorite meal? My favorite meal is a good question. Um, well, I love sushi, I have to say. I love sushi, I'm really big on that. Um, I love puddings, you know, all kinds of puddings. This isn't necessarily a meal, this is like little diverse food items that I like, but you, yeah, know, you know, you got your rice pudding, you got your tapioca pudding, you've got your banana pudding with vanilla wafers in it, you know, there's just all kinds of puddings. There's something just great about those. Uh, bread pudding, I think I'm a connoisseur of bread pudding, honestly, so that's a big one. Um, and another thing I really like is fresh fruit, you know, just off of a tree. Right? Like just walking down the street and you find something, you pick it, you get to eat it. I mean, that's just sublime. You know, what's so better good. than that? It is. All right. What motivates you? What motivates me? Yeah. What motivates you? I would say, in a word, it's kind of my spiritual foundation. And in a word, I would say it's God's love. That's the concept. That's what motivates me. Um, when I go to work every day, I'm thinking, God's going to bring some people into my path who need their problem solved, 
right? They're by definition in some kind of physical pain or distress. On top of that, there's some emotional suffering that's going on, right? This is a causing a problem for them. There's activities in life that they can't participate in. This is costing them money, you know, towards medical bills that they really can't probably afford, right? And this is weighing them down emotionally, you know? And so I'm thinking, I need to show God's love for this person to help bring them some healing, to help put together some things that are broken right now, and to encourage them kind of from the inside out that they're special, they're listened to, they're cared for, and there is hope for them. Okay, what does a day in the life of Dr. Turner look like? A day in the life of Dr. Turner? Well, um, I get up and there's a certain room that I go to with some nice big windows, and so I'm looking out the window, and I'm just kind of like <sighs> reflecting and kind of getting my mind right, you know, for my day. So I'm looking at the trees, I'm looking at birds, um, I'm kind of getting my mind connected up with God, getting my heart right, and just being thankful for my day and kind of counting my blessings, you know? Um, and you know, you see the sun come up, you see some birds come out, and it's like, yeah, this is a good world we live in. It's a beautiful world. It's got its problems, but it's got its beauty, you know? And I'm not gonna be so busy that I can't take five minutes right now to appreciate this beautiful world, you know? And, uh, and then go to work. Well, before that, I usually make my shake. <laughs> so I got a little protein shake I make, you know, put some, different protein powders in there. I mean, you think I was a chemist or something. I opened up my cupboard, there's all kinds of powders and this and that. But anyway, healthy stuff, throw that in there, make a shake, go to work, um, right after work, work out usually. And then the evening, talking on the phone with my wife, you know, uh, or just visiting, which is great. I mean, she's also my best friend and she's a great conversationalist. So I really look forward to that. I mean, we laugh, we can talk for an hour, you know, no problem. And then I like to end my day by some kind of reading and learning. So. This is where I'm reading, I'm journaling, I'm trying to learn something. I'm kind of big on personal growth and self-improvement, you know, and so I'm always reading along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is kind of off the cuff and out there a little bit, but what's your favorite car? What's my favorite car? Well, I, I'm not big on cars and I don't have a favorite car at this point, okay, but nostalgia, I would say growing up, Magnum PI, right? He had that red Ferrari. And I thought that thing was just the coolest car. That made a big impression on me. Then you got Back to the Future, and you got that DeLorean in Back to the Future. So that was rad, and I always thought it was real cool. And then uh, I always thought Porsches were just pretty neat, especially Porsche 911, just the way it's kind of sloped and contoured towards the back. I just thought that, that had a nice little aesthetic to it. You know, it's pretty unique. Um, and to tell a story about a Porsche for a second here, too. So I have a friend from medical school great guy. He became a heart surgeon, like lives down in Laguna Beach, California, big old house up in the hills. He's living easy, okay? He's got this beautiful red Porsche. I'm down visiting him. I come in on his car. He's like, oh, would you like to drive it? You can take my Porsche out, no problem. I was like, yes, this is a dream. I'm going to get to drive my Porsche 911. This thing is red. I'm going to be cruising around the hills in Southern California, you know, beach views. Like, it doesn't get any better than this, okay? I go out to his car. It's a stick shift. I don't know how to drive stick shift. This is embarrassing, don't judge me, but I don't know how to drive stick shift, okay? There was that time in high school, my dad tried to teach me, you know, we were all er, er, back and forth on the pickup truck. I blew out some whatever pads and this and that. He got frustrated, I got frustrated. I said, forget about this. I never went back and learned. So I lost my chance to drive my Porsche because I couldn't drive a stick shift. So it's I'm still okay. kind of suffering through that. All right, one last question for you, and this just goes yeah. to, uh, you know, your good heart. When you volunteer your time, what organizations do you like to help? Oh, cool. Well, I started an organization a few years ago. We're kind of on hibernation right now, but I would love it to get going again, and that's called Aspire. And Aspire has the mission of offering people with criminal records an opportunity to improve their lives through work. And so it was a work opportunity and a mentoring opportunity for these men and women um, coming out of jail or prison into our community. You know, so many times um, they're not given a second chance or they're sort of uh, expectations and judgments about them. Um, and I kind of feel like, yes, if you did the crime, you do your time, absolutely. I'm as hard on crime as the next guy, let's just say, right? But also, once you've done that, what, sh what should our attitude be towards them as a community, right? Like, should we be welcoming them back? Should we give them a second chance? Should we provide opportunities? Or should we just say, you stay over here, out of sight, you know, out of mind, right? Um, and so I want our community to be a welcoming place and a place where we communicate in our words and actions that, you know, you're a special person. God made you. You're still alive. There's hope. There's potential. It's not done. Redemption is a great word. You know, let's bring some redemption into this situation. So that's what Aspire has been all about. 
Um, right now, uh, there's also another great organization getting started here called Grace Kitchen and I've been asked to be on the board of directors of that, and that's really cool. And basically, its motto is employing and empowering women out of poverty. And so they work with women to uh, create some specialty food items um, and job opportunity and Christian mentorship along, uh, along, this, along the way and just kind of help them get their lives back on track.